And it sounds like he's got the support of at least one conservative radio superstar who says, do not underestimate President Trump. Hello and welcome to Fox News at Night. I'm Shannon Bream in Washington. We've got Fox team coverage tonight. Trace Gallagher gauging how the conservative base is responding to the deal. But we begin with correspondent Kristen Fisher on the latest from the White House. We're standing by. Good evening, Kristen. Good evening, Shannon. Well, we're getting a clue tonight of where the president's head is at from one of the key Republican negotiators. Senator Richard, Shel Richard Shelby said that he spoke with President Trump tonight and that he sounded reasonable. He said the president expressed concern that this deal does not give him as much money as he wanted for a wall. But Senator Shelby says he pointed out you weren't going to get any money with this deal. You would at least get some money. I told him, I said, Mr. President, this is only a down payment on the wall. And I said, you know, they said you weren't going to get any money. We did get you some money. We've done best we can, Republicans and Democrats coming together. We've been more interested in what is best for America, not what might be best for uh, one person's ego. Now, the exact language of the bill is still being worked out, but congressional aides say that the deal includes $1.375 billion for physical barriers at the border, 55 miles of new fencing using any currently deployed design, such as metal slats. The deal does not include a cap on immigrants detained in the United States, but it would provide a path to reduce ICE detention beds. It would also include improvements to customs and border protection holding facilities. Well, earlier today, President Trump said he's not thrilled about the deal, but he also signaled that he would be very reluctant to shut the government down all over again. I don't think you're going to see a shutdown. I wouldn't want to go to it now. If you did have it, it's a Democrat's fault. And I accepted the first one, and I'm proud of what we've accomplished, because people learned during that shutdown all about the problems coming in from the southern border. I accept. I've always accepted it. But this one, I would never accept if it happens, but I don't think it's going to happen. Well, at that rally last night in El Paso, President Trump said it didn't matter what the deal was, that he was going to build the wall no matter what, meaning he could still declare a national emergency at the border. And tonight, Senator Lindsey Graham said deal or no deal, he thinks President Trump will do it. He has some authority without a national emergency to reprogram money. And the other way is to declare a national emergency and move money around. I think he'll do both. I think he wants that fight. I think he's saying, from my point of view, this is a national emergency. And I think he's willing to have that fight with Congress and the courts. In terms of a timeline for this new agreement, the committee hopes to have the text of the bill done by tomorrow night so that the House can vote on Thursday, just one day before the deadline. Shannon, they're cutting it very close. As we seem to always do here in Washington on these tough issues. Kristen, thank you very much. Thank you. At under mounting pressure to sign the funding deal tonight, it looks like the president is getting support from arguably the most influential conservative radio talk host on the waves. Uh, Trace Gallagher is here with more on that. Hey, Trace. Hey, Shannon, that conservative commentator is, of course, Rush Limbaugh, who today told his listeners if the president signs a bill that allocates less than the $5.7 billion he demanded for the wall, it cannot be looked at as a defeat. In fact, just the opposite. Watch. Anything that happens that solidifies and cements that effort as being taken and underway, the president can portray as a win, can always hold out the card of a declaration of a national emergency to get the rest of it built and so forth. So Limbaugh gave the president his blessing even while he cited poll numbers from Rasmussen, which is an outlier in the real clear politics average, showing that shutting down the government again would be politically beneficial to the president again. But Limbaugh went on to say that nobody can say the president caved on the premise of controlling illegal immigration. Tell that to conservative commentator Ann Coulter, who today ripped the president, calling a bipartisan compromise the president's yellow New Deal, quoting Trump talks a good game on the border wall, but it's increasingly clear he's afraid to fight for it. A few weeks ago, when the president and lawmakers struck a deal to end the partial government shutdown, Coulter called President Trump a wimp. The president quickly shot back, calling her a hostile person and unfollowing her on Twitter. But at the time, GOP Senator Bob Corker and Democratic Senator Dick Durbin said the president thinks that losing conservative radio hosts means losing his base. So for the record, here's where other 
other conservatives now stand. Our own Sean Hannity opposes a deal, calling it, quote, a garbage compromise. Laura Ingram is a no, saying the deal is, quote, pathetic. Fox and Friends is a yes. Breitbart and Matt Drudge appear to be on the fence, as is the president, who said he doesn't like the compromise, but also stopped short of rejecting it. Shannon. All right, Trace Gallagher, thank you very much. Well, the verdict is in for notorious Mexican drug kingpin Joaquin El Chapo Guzman. White House Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders tweeting out a short while ago, El Chapo's reign of terror is over. He'll spend the rest of his life in a maximum security prison. The threat from violent drug cartels is real. We must secure our border. And tonight, prominent lawmaker sees El Chapo's conviction as a way to get more cash for President Trump's border wall. Correspondent Brian Yedes joins us with details. Brian. That's right, Shannon. One Republican senator is now proposing legislation mandating that all of El Chapo's drug proceeds, that's billions of dollars, be used to fund the border wall. Now that Joaquin El Chapo Guzman was found guilty on all 10 counts, including murder, conspiracy, and drug trafficking, the world's most notorious drug lord will now spend the rest of his life in a U.S. prison. After six days of deliberations, four men and eight women found El Chapo led the Sinaloa cartel over the course of 25 years, smuggling hundreds of tons of cocaine, heroin, and marijuana into the United States. The evidence in this case was overwhelming. 56 witnesses testified, including 14 cooperating witnesses, El Chapo's closest associates. There were guns, seized cocaine, drug ledgers, incriminating wiretap phone calls, and personal text messages, all of it leading to one damning conclusion. Conclusion. El Chapo was the man behind the curtains. He pulled all the strings. He directed all of the production, the smuggling, the transportation, the distribu distribution of billions upon billions of dollars worth of narcotics into the United States. The defense tried to cast reasonable doubt. Ultimately, though, they conceded the avalanche of evidence proved to be too much. We fought like uh, complete uh, savages and left it all on the battlefield um, for Joaquin Guzman. Meanwhile, in Washington, D.C., as debate continues over funding for a border wall, Republican Senator Ted Cruz tweeted this video, urging senators to pass the El Chapo Act, a bill Cruz introduced that would make El Chapo pay for a border wall by mandating that all of his drug money forfeited to the U.S. government must be used to pay for a wall. It's estimated El Chapo made $14 billion. So far, though, huge stashes of cash have yet to be found. El Chapo's lawyers say they'll appeal. He'll be sentenced on June 25th. Given his history, twice escaping from Mexico's prisons, it's highly likely he'll be serving this life sentence in America's most secure prison, Supermax in Colorado. Shannon? All right, Brian Yenis, thank you very much. So tonight, as we await word on whether the president will endorse the current border deal, Congress is wasting no time. Expected to move ahead with this deal in principle as soon as tomorrow. Let's bring in Democratic strategist Howard Franklin and former Border Patrol chief under President Obama, Mark Morgan. Great to have both of you with us tonight. Thanks, Shannon. All right, Mark, I want to start with you because we've been hearing from a lot of people who are so-called experts on the issues going on at the border. So what do you make of the deal, the contours of it, as you know, right now? So, as you said, as, as the contours we know right now, from, from a law enforcement and Border Patrol perspective, this proposal is a fail. And it clearly demonstrates, Shannon, to me, that they have not listening to the experts. The experts have been saying again and again and again the tools and resources they need. They've made their case. They've backed it up with fact and historical data, of which that multi-layered plan is 230 additional miles of physical barrier mm -hmm. and strategic locations to help the operational control to stem the flow of drugs and bad things. And Congress today said... Nope, we're not listening to the experts. We know better. This bill, as it's proposed, is a fail. Well, uh, you know, Howard, the president has a choice here. Uh, he says he doesn't anticipate another government shutdown, but this is the deal on the table for now. I, in, in my opinion, uh, President Trump has to sign this deal. He can't politically afford another shutdown. He doesn't want to doom his reelection prospects. And the fact of the matter is he's asking to have his cake and eat it, too, at this point. Uh, he's hedging on the deal, and I think he's going to leave himself the room uh, to ask for this uh, the emergency that will allow him to look for more funds, whether mm. it's 
uh, Senator Cruz's bill or some other uh, some other avenue to find more funds to pay for an actual border yeah. wall. And it sounds like tonight there is a debate, clearly a partisan one, about whether or not he has the ability to move these funds without some congressional action. And we could be talking about different pots of money and different laws uh, that could come into play here, but hear from both sides of the aisle about what they think. He doesn't have the authority to do it without House uh, permission. He ought to feel free to use whatever tools he can legally use to enhance his effort to secure the border. So, no, I would not be uh, troubled by that. So, Mark, I know you don't love the deal, but the president has this allegedly in front of him as, the, as it comes together and gets onto paper. Um, but there may be some other options, but it sounds like Congress is going to fight him, at least the Democrats, if he tries to move money without somehow getting them involved. Well, so what's interesting, one, one silver lining in this, if I, if I can find one, is, well, I think we can put to rest that walls are immoral uh, or ineffective, because at least they said, we'll give you $1.3 billion for the wall so we can put that to rest. But what's frustrating, just from an American citizen standpoint, is so Congress fails to do what they need to to, safe, to to secure this country by giving the tools to the experts that they need to, to secure our borders. Instead, they're going to toss it to the president. So I hope the president stays strong, and he, if he can legally reprogram and declare national emergency, I hope he does, to give the, the, the men and women risking their lives every day the tools they need mm -hmm. to protect this country. Well, he sounds upbeat tonight. Just a little while ago, he tweeted out this. He says, I want to thank all Republicans for the work you've done in dealing with the radical left on border security. Not an easy task, but the wall is being built and will be a great achievement and contributor toward life and safety within our country. Howard, he is putting a positive spin on this. He got money for the wall, 55 additional miles. Um, so he sounds like he's trying to stay upbeat with what's, what's on he the table. Is he does sound like he's trying to stay a bit. It's, it certainly sounds like a positive spin. I don't know that his base will buy it. I think that a number of conservative talk radio hosts have already panned this deal. Uh, and I think really the, the question is not so much whether or not he's got the authority to do so, but what are the implications for redirecting funds that are otherwise used for our military, for other projects that are ongoing in this country and around the world. And I think, to me, that, that's really the real political risk uh, he's running if he tries to redivert funds. Well, time is up. So they've got some decisions to make at the White House and on Capitol Hill. In the meantime, Howard and Mark, great to have you both with us. Thank you. Thanks, Shannon. Thank you. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says it is time to put up or shut up as he plans a vote on House freshman Democrats Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's Green New Deal. So this is a move that will put Democrats, including several 2020 contenders, on the spot. And now on the record, some Democrats say, hey, they're feeling optimistic. I think it's absolutely realistic, and I frankly think we need to set our sights high. And California slams the brakes on an older green deal, citing cost overruns and a lack of transparency. So how is the governor responding to accusations that he's losing his progressive edge? Progressive Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is headed to the Senate floor for a vote forcing Democrats to take a public stand on how they feel about the plan that could cost tens of trillions of dollars, all while pro proposing radical changes to life as you now know it. Senior Capitol Hill producer Chad Pergram explains. Good evening, Chad. Shannon, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell wants to put Democrats on the spot on the controversial New Green Deal, especially all the potential and declared 2020 presidential candidates serving in the Senate. Republicans say New York freshman Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's Green New Deal is contentious because while it calls for the U.S. to transition away from fossil fuels, it's also laced with ideas like eliminating air travel and guaranteeing all Americans a government job and paid vacations no matter what. To hear Republicans tell it, that's a socialist pipe dream and a real nightmare. Senate Democrat Chris Murphy co-sponsored a Green New Deal in the Senate last week calling for a sweeping overhaul of the entire U.S. economy in 10 years. I think it's absolutely realistic, and I frankly think we need to set our sights high. I've noted with great interest the Green New Deal, and we're going to be voting on that in the Senate. We'll give everybody an opportunity to go on record and uh, see how they feel about McConnell that. opposes the Green New Deal and dislikes show votes. But in this case, McConnell wants to show where Democrats stand on the Green New Deal, especially the growing legion of 2020 hopefuls. New York's Kirsten Gillibrand.
Minnesota's Amy Klobuchar, California's Kamala Harris, Cory Booker of New Jersey, Elizabeth Warren of Massachusetts, and even possible candidates like Vermont's Bernie Sanders and Ohio's Sherrod Brown. But there's a risk for some Republicans, too. Such a vote would force Republicans like Cory Gardner of Colorado and Susan Collins of Maine to weigh in as well. Both face challenging re-election bids next year. Republicans should answer is, what is their answer on climate change? What are they going to put forward? Two years ago, Republicans tried to pin down Democratic senators on how they'd vote on Bernie Sanders' Medicare for All plan. The vote was zero yeas and 57 nays. That's because all Democrats avoided taking a position. They voted present. Shannon? All right, Chad Pergram on the Hill, thank you. As the progressive Green New Deal pushes for a big build-out of high-speed rail with the goal of making air travel fairly obsolete, California's governor is pulling the plug on moving forward on his state's high-speed rail project from San Diego to Sacramento. The current project, as planned, would cost too much and respectfully take too long. There's been too little oversight and not enough transparency. Let's bring in Fox News politics editor, editor of the Halftime Report, the Chris Steyerwall. Good to see you. Howdy, ma'am. Okay, so uh, Mitch McConnell says we're going to give everybody a chance. They seem very excited about this deal, so we're going to let them go on the record. Well, and it really puts them in a pickle because this is a resolution that was designed. It's an aspirational. It's a feeling, mm -hmm. right? And the Democrats say, well, it's not fair because it's not legislation that's made. It's just a sentiment. It's an idea that we support this concept. And then McConnell is saying, okay, well, you'll have the opportunity to, to do this. Uh, you'll have an opportunity to say this out loud. Now, yeah, it's problematic for the Democrats who are running for president, sure, potentially in a general, but the real problems come in if you're a red state Democrat who's got to think about re-election mm -hmm. where you live. Uh, and you can't deal with, you, you can't be doing that, but then again, at the same time, so let's say you're a Democrat in a very blue state where you might face a primary challenge mm -hmm. if you don't vote for it. They need a, uh, they need a, uh, a, a trap door here. And I think Ed Markey, uh, the author in the mm -hmm. Senate, has already sort of laid out what they're, this doesn't count and we're not going to hold this mm -hmm against anybody. Okay. So I think you'll probably get what you got in 2017 The Chad mentioned mm -hmm. where the Medicare for all or the single payer that McConnell let that ride on as an amendment that there will be probably some Democrats who vote no on this. There might be some red state Democrats mm -hmm. who say, I'll take it. If you're Doug Jones in Alabama, right. you'd probably like a free shot Imagine. to vote, right, to vote yeah. no on something that's not ever going to pass anyway. But for the rest of them, they might yeah. go back to do just present. You mentioned Senator Ed Markey, obviously a Democrat, who yep. is a big proponent and sponsor of moving forward with this. He says McConnell is threatening to sabotage the Green New Deal by making people vote on it. He says the principles of the Green New Deal resonate with the American people. But don't make us vote on it. Well, look, it, it is trickery, right? We know it's a trick, um, but it's also a trick that the Democrats left themselves wide open for because they didn't have to propose this resolution. Mm -hmm. They didn't have to put it in. I mean, it's a bill. It's in Congress. It's available. It's available to vote on. So McConnell's just taking them at their word. They could have talked about this stuff. I think Howard Dean and some other Democrats have given some counsel to the fellow members of their party, which is lots of discussions are good. Be careful the words that you use. Be careful the things that you say because they're going to come right back at mm -hmm. you in a year or so. All right. I want to play um, Senator Amy Klobuchar obviously mm -hmm. has announced her presidential run. She's a Democrat. She was with Brett tonight on special report. He asked her about voting for this. Here's what she said. The Green New Deal, I see it as, by the way, I see it as aspirational. I see it as a jump start. So I would vote yes, but I would also, if it got down to the nitty gritty of an actual legislation as opposed to, oh, here are some goals we have, uh, that would be different for me. As you said, therein lies the difference. But I would imagine every 2020 contender is probably going to vote yes on this because there's a race to the left and who's going to be most progressive. Well, there's a race to the left, but as I say, uh, there's also another way out here, which is that they can say, we're going to hold everybody harmless. You just vote mm -hmm. present in protest of the of McConnell's mm -hmm. tactics here so that nobody has to pay the price for it. Because if you're Sherrod Brown, let's say you're from Ohio, that's not on brand for you. And he uh, certainly he's an environmentalist and certainly he's liberal in that way, but it's not on brand if you're from a manufacturing state, including Minnesota. So it's fine to talk about it aspirationally as she does, but then you don't want to really get down uh, to the details. So they may come up with a hack here mm. where they say, well, we're all going to vote president and this doesn't count because we're just protesting. We're protesting the method. Well, if you love the deal, maybe you should, you know, go beyond voting president. It's we'll almost see. like people in Washington are insincere. I don't know what whether, are I don't know, we're going to continue about. to look into this you here have with my the faith. team, but there could be <laughs> we'll some political cynicism that takes place here. I don't know. I don't know what you speak of, but it's good to have you speaking. Chris Dyerwald, thank you. You bet.
All right, late breaking news tonight in a brutal murder mystery. A woman's body found stuffed in a suitcase. Plus, the woman who claimed she was raped by Virginia's lieutenant governor speaks out. It's killing us. It is taking everything out of ourselves just to function in this world. Virginia Republican Winsome Earl Sears and Gianna Caldwell tackle the latest on the allegations against Virginia's lieutenant governor. And disputed Venezuelan leader Nicolas Maduro blocks humanitarian aid, saying the U.S. is to blame for the whole mess. to investigate and they vow that they'll cooperate in any way they can. That woman, Dr. Vanessa Tyson, is speaking out tonight for the first time. Correspondent David Spun is here with the story. Hey, David. Hey, Shannon. Good evening. This is the first time we've actually heard an accuser of Justin Fairfax, the lieutenant governor, speak on camera. But to be clear, she did not talk about the lieutenant governor or her name in the headlines. Dr. Vanessa Tyson is a politics professor at Scripps College in California. She's a sexual violence awareness advocate. Just a few hours ago, she appeared at a live stream symposium called Betrayal and Courage in the Age of Me Too. Tyson was scheduled to appear at the symposium long before she was alleged that Justin Fairfax sexually assaulted her. Now, we do know that Tyson said... Sexual violence and, and sexual assault in our lives can have a very uh, prominent impact on our understanding of ourselves, our bodies, the world around us. Tyson mentioned Christine Blasey Ford, the woman who last fall accused Justice Brett Kavanaugh of sexual assault. As she shook, we shook with her. As she told her story, we felt the pain that she so visibly demonstrated. Impeachment talk regarding Fairfax is slowing down. Instead, it appears lawmakers are looking to launch an independent investigation of the lieutenant governor. Now, while Dr. Tyson didn't discuss the Fairfax case on camera tonight, she has been talking through her attorneys. In a letter to Virginia lawmakers, her attorneys wrote, quote, any investigation into the serious allegations of sexual assault made by our client, Dr. Vanessa Tyson, will demonstrate that Lieutenant Governor Fairfax lacks the moral fitness to continue in public office. Now, Fairfax continues to maintain his innocence and welcomes an investigation insisting it will clear his name. Another woman named Meredith Watson released a statement through her attorneys, says she too was raped by Fairfax. Meanwhile, Governor Ralph Northam, facing his own calls to resign over that racist yearbook photo, said in an interview this week he wants to focus on race relations for his remaining three years in office. Just today, the governor announced he restore the voting rights of 10,000 former felons. Shannon, it's clear he's moving past this scandal in his mind, wants to focus on his job as governor. And he holds on to it for now. David, thank you. You bet. All right, let's bring in former Republican member of the Virginia House of Delegates, Winsome Sears, and Fox News political analyst, Gianno Caldwell. Welcome to both of you. Great to have you with us tonight. Thank you. Uh, Winsome, I want to start you. with you. I mean, it seemed like less than two weeks ago when this whole thing broke with Governor Northam, I mean, that he may not survive the evening as governor or the weekend. And now it seems like he firmly has a hold, staying in the governor's mansion and keeping his job. What do you make of it? Well, he needs to go and he needs to take the lieutenant governor with him. And while he's at it, he needs to take the attorney general. All three of them have to go. It's not as if there aren't any other honorable people in uh, the Commonwealth who can uh, govern. Uh, we have respectable people here. We have other people who have intellectual abilities who can govern. And they all need to go home. Go home and resign and allow us to continue the business of the Commonwealth mm -hmm. and, so know, that they can figure out the okay. choices that led them to this mm -hmm. position. Well, and Diano, of course, um, what Winsome says is that that would be the three top Democrats in the state going, and that would leave then governance of the state to a Republican. An interesting piece by a Harvard professor in the New York Times. The headline is, Will Power Trump Values in Virginia? She writes this, Though a trickle of Virginia lawmakers continues to call for Mr. Northam's resignation, it is increasingly apparent that Democrats in Virginia and across the nation have adopted a political tactic that explicitly is about protecting their power. Giano, any chance all three of them go? Probably not, not likely. And I, you know, someone interesting, Nina Turner, she was a power player in democratic politics. Now she works with Bernie Sanders' organizations. 
She said the Democrats specifically need to stop making this about President Trump because racism was here way before that. And I find it to be very interesting that even folks within Virginia, they're saying that the black voters are going to forgive the governor, especially with some of the acts that he's committing to now. And what was even more troubling, what I read um, from the Virginia uh, vice chairman of the Black Caucus, he said, we need to support our fellow Democrats. Unite, united we stand, divided we fall. He said, I can't forsake Governor Northam for acting white in America. If you don't find that troubling, I don't know what you'll find troubling. And the fact of the matter is, Democrats across this country, whether it be Virginia or somewhere else, there's a complete and total de double standard when it comes to race and racism in this country. If a Republican does something, it's despicable. But if they do it, they find a way for polite words and keep them in office. And I find that disgusting. Well, and a lot of people think this just should not be a partisan conversation. Uh, the attorneys for it Dr. Vanessa be. Tyson. It shouldn't be. It really should not. Yeah, I mean, they say this. They said she's a it staunch Democrat, and Dr. Tyson has no motive to fabricate such frame uh, claims and has come forward at great personal risk. Winsome? Well, I got to tell you, there is precedent here in Virginia for ousting uh, the lieutenant governor. When I was first elected in 2002, we had the very first Republican Speaker of the House of Delegates, and he had been the first Republican Speaker since the 1880s. And yet, when we heard that he had paid off someone who worked for him, a woman, because he had made sexual advances against her, we said he had to go. And we pressured him to go. He knew in no uncertain terms that he had to go. And this was a man who many of us uh, had been helped by him. But you know, when the thing is right, the thing is right. Now, I noticed that when Justice Kavanaugh was having his confirmation hearings, there wasn't a microphone that a Democrat wasn't before saying he has to go, he can't do this, blah, 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 blah. And yet, here, here we are now, and the other day I saw uh, the lieutenant governor walking towards the General Assembly, the place where they're going to be making the laws for the rest of us to live under here in the Commonwealth, and he had a white female senator on one hand and a black female senator on the other hand, and you know what they were doing? They were shielding him from the media so he wouldn't have to answer oh. any questions. What, what about the, the, the pound me too? What about that? We Republicans removed our Speaker of the House, a Republican yeah. Speaker, and they sit there and watch this man on the dais as he acknowledges and addresses with Robert's Rules of Order mm -hmm. and, and, and calls on the Senator from Norfolk and the Senator from so-and-so, and they're making laws for us. What a farce well, when they could say, Mr. 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 Lieutenant Governor, each one yeah. of them can stand and say, we ask you to resign, and we ask you to do that now. Well, and none of them have done that. Yeah, they've got three people they would have to probably say that to on various different grounds. We've got to leave it there because we're out of time. But listen, uh, he's asked for due process. His accusers have asked for the same, so we'll see where this goes from here. Gianna and Winsome, thank you both very much. Thank you. All right, the, the president talks late-term abortion with New York's governor following the passage of a controversial new bill there. And Democrats block yet another bill aimed at banning what Republicans are calling infanticide following Virginia Governor Ralph Northam's controversial comments. Senator Ben Sass says there should be nothing partisan about this issue. He's with us live. Next. President Trump and New York Governor Andrew Cuomo meeting at the White House discussing a range of issues from high tax rates in New York uh, to the Empire State's new abortion law passed last month. The bill allows women to get abortions after 24 weeks if their life or health, including mental health, is threatened by the pregnancy or if the fetus is not viable. Meanwhile, Democrats still dispute what the New York legislation said and a similar proposal in Virginia, what they actually do. Are you saying there's no such thing as late-term abortions or they're overplaying the concerns about that? Well, later, I mean, actual people who work in this field, gynecologists, they don't actually use that term. It was actually something created by the pro-life lobby to scare people about this. But there are, there are abortions, abortions that, that can occur. happen up to a due right. date, what but do that you is call not that? After your, after your due date, there are no... Up there are no infants date. up to your due date that it goes by doctors at least use the weeks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's bring in Jim Daly from Focus on the Family to talk about that, and Republican Senator from Nebraska, Ben Sass, who offered up a measure on the Senate floor designed to protect infants born alive after botched abortions, but it was blocked by Democrats. Welcome to you both. Great to have you with us. Good to be here. 
Uh, and Senator, Good you wrote you. you wrote an op-ed piece today outlining this. And you say this really should not be a, a partisan issue. This should be something that all Americans can agree upon. Yeah, there's, there's hardly a more basic truth in life than the fact that a little baby who uh, survives a botched abortion and she's on that table fighting for life, she has dignity, she's an image bearer, she has worth and she has rights and we have a moral obligation to provide the same care to that baby that we would to any other baby that had been born. All right, this is what Senator Patty Murray, Democrat, who blocked this measure from moving forward, here's what she said about the bill. We have laws against infanticide in this country. This is a gross misinterpretation of the actual language of the bill that is being asked to be considered, and therefore I object. Okay, so she's saying this is already illegal, and, and your bill was about something else. Yeah, it, this I, I am pro-life. Uh, this bill, though, is really just about protecting those babies that survive an abortion. And the argument that Senator Murray from Washington appears to be making is that because no one is proactively taking a pillow and putting it over the baby's face as she's cold and alone on that table and smothering her to death, then there's no problem here because she says there's no one actively doing the killing. Well, there's a phenomenon called backing away where the doctors just get out of the situation and leave the baby to die by exposure. You don't do that to a six-month-old baby. You don't do that to a 12-month-old baby. They also couldn't survive without care. These babies have rights, and we should, we should be caring for them. Yeah, Jim, this is a really, uh, for a lot of people, it's an uncomfortable conversation. They don't want to talk about the realities of uh, the facts of what's before them in some of these cases. I mean, it's, it's terrible. No one wants to think about these situations. Um, and I want yeah, I want to read a piece from the New York, or the New Jersey Star-Ledger, from the editorial board. Uh, the headline is, The Truth About Late-Term Abortion. They say this, there's no such thing as abortion moments before birth. Doctors do not deliver babies and then kill them. Well, I did cover Kermit Gosnell, so unless we're talking about him. The central conceit behind that claim is that women will seek out late-term abortions for cavalier reasons, and doctors will perform them with the indulgence of craven politicians. They say that you, when you talk about this, it's just a scare tactic. This is not something that's really happening. No, it's happening, and people need to realize that. I think even the governor in his description that he gave us on that radio show, it's interesting they never complete the statement. They say that baby will be born, and if it's not viable or if it has a severe handicap, it'll be kept comfortable, and then the woman can talk to the doctor. And that's where they end the conversation. What are they going to talk about? They're going to talk about ending that baby's life. And that needs to be said, but unfortunately, those on the other side who believe in uh, a pro-choice position, they won't disclose that to people, and that's what we're talking about. And I'm so proud of Senator Sass and the other pro-life senators that are saying enough is enough. This is too far. Um, it's interesting to me that PolitiFact rated as false the claim that a baby could actually be aborted a minute before it was born in New York under this new law. Now, they went through an interesting discussion talking to a, an OBGYN saying, well, there would be hours of labor, the baby would be crowning, so technically not the minute before, um, but the day before, the week before. Yeah, this this is a, these are silly discussions when people are trying to equivocate about those kinds of arguments. The reality is what New York did was try to strip protections for babies right up until the moment of birth. And then they went out and they said, let's celebrate this and light up the World Trade Center in pink lights. Think about what pink has symbolized. This has been about breast cancer survivors. That's what the color pink has meant. And these are tough, gritty women. And they did something. They persevered. They succeeded. This is a celebration of life. And now people are trying to pervert that imagery and turn it to something that is used to celebrate death. It's wrong. And the American people happily know that it's wrong. The, the pro-life movement uh, is pro-compassion. It's pro-baby. It's pro-mom. And it's pro-science. And happily, the American people uh, are getting this more and more. I mean, Jim, is that your sense? I'll give you the final word here. Yeah, Shannon, I appreciate that. Latest polling shows that about 80% of Americans do not support late-term abortion. Even amongst those who support a, a pro-choice position, about 70% of them do not support late-term abortion. So the Democrats, they can go this way, but it is not what the American people want. And I think for us, we're going to uh, say no. It stops now, and we're going to do all we can to help get that message out. All right, Jim, Senator Sass, uh, we know your measure blocked in the Senate four times a similar measure blocked in the House, but the conversation continues. Thank you both for being here. Appreciate it. All right, next up, 2020 in 60, Senator Kamala Harris brags about smoking weed, and political observers think they know why. Plus, we examine the political impact of allegations from racism to sexism to anti-Semitism plaguing the Democratic Party, desperate to claim the moral high ground.
2020 in 60 seconds, a week after apologizing for her claims of Native American heritage, Democratic Senator and 2020 contender Elizabeth Warren made a surprise appearance today at a luncheon honoring Native American women. Warren took the